Um, so I'm Julie Rittner, Central Valley Regional Director for River Partners. Um, for those of you who don't know River Partners, we're a um, nonprofit conservation organization. We focus entirely in the Central Valley. Sorry, I'll get closer to the mic. Um, we, we focus in the Central Valley from uh, Redding to Bakersfield. We work on all the major rivers in the Central Valley. Um, uh, our organization was founded by two conservation-minded farmers in the Chico area who were watching the Sacramento River riparian habitat restoration work unfold before them. And they said, hey, we're pretty good at growing plants. I bet we can do this pretty cheap and pretty fast. Let's give it a try. Um, so they started basically farming riparian forests um, on restoration projects in the Sacramento Valley. And in um, 2002, we opened an office in Modesto, uh, which is where I work out of, um, and started working on the San Joaquin River. Uh, River Partners works mainly on large scale uh, riparian habitat restoration projects. So these are areas where there's really broad floodplains on the river. Um, we've worked on the major levee setback projects on the Feather River and the Bear River up north in the Sac Valley. Um, and we work a lot with um, the large scale planning efforts the Department of Water Resources is undertaking to do um, integrated flood management, habitat restoration, agricultural conservation work. Um, so the photo you're looking at here is the San Joaquin River just uh, south of the, the county border with San Joaquin County over in Stanislaus County. Uh, where the river meanders a great deal in between flood control levees um, on the, let's see if this works. Yeah. So uh, behind the levee on this side of the photo, you can see uh, that's uh, restored riparian forest. It's about seven years old in this photo. And uh, you can still see the flood control levee there, which keeps the river from um, accessing the floodplain except in breached locations. Uh, so it has a very not natural flood up and drawdown regime on the land side of the levee there, but it still uh, functions in a way that maintains habitat for uh, a variety of avian and terrestrial species. And then on the other side of the river, you can see what this landscape looks like before restoration. So um, a lot of the riverside areas, even on the inside of the levees, have been uh, cleared of their vegetation, leveled, and are um, farmed for forage or row crops, and in some cases, there's even uh, permanent crops down there. Um, <clears throat> so I'll skip that one. So uh, for context, uh, John was talking about the San Joaquin River Restoration Program, um, which focuses in this stretch of the San Joaquin, just to the Merced River confluence. Um, <clears throat> And the river changes a lot once you get past that Merced River confluence, right? There's um, a lot of kind of uh, water management considerations that really change the ecology of the San Joaquin River in that area. But once you get the input from the Merced, the Tuolumne, and the Stanislaus, the river becomes a really mighty river again. Um, <clears throat> what that means for conservation and for restoration is just enormous complexity. So on this map, you can also see the delivery uh, canals, the aqueduct, the San Luis Reservoir, all of these different pieces that are managed by different organizations, agencies, or districts. Um, and these are just kind of the major infrastructure parts that, that are occurring or that are influencing the way the floodplains work on the San Joaquin River. So it's complex. Um, so when I was preparing to give this talk, I was thinking, well, you know, the, the real message that I want to drive home here is about uh, how we, we work with many, many partners to develop projects and the way that you can encourage active participation from a diversity of, of partners who might have um, different perspectives on a lot of things is to design multiple benefit projects um, where the parties that you're bringing to the table might not all have the exact same goal in mind, but we have shared challenges of some kind. So the project moves forward solving shared challenges. Um, and there might be many goals to the project. So when River Partners, you know, uh, works with, with coalitions and groups to try to put together restoration projects, we kind of conceive of the river as providing the, these uh, listed services. And um, uh, across the Central Valley, there's such a wide diversity of groups who interact on the water supply river service. So you might have local irrigation districts, you might have very sophisticated water districts or urban districts. Um, <clears throat> or uh, water districts that actually just export water from the valley. And so um, 
uh, finding a way to, to bring our kind of biology staff and our conservation staff up to speed with folks who, who speak water supply is a real challenge. Um, yeah, we uh, attend lots of meetings, have lots of conversations, and um, you know, draw on resources from the community to try to understand how to speak to water engineers. It's hard. Uh, flood conveyance is another place where we've um, spent a lot of time just getting to know the engineers, the nitty gritty, sitting in you know frustrating meetings where they don't understand our biology and we don't understand their engineering and finding a way to speak the same language and find those um, shared challenges that together we can find solutions for. <clears throat> Even within the world of wildlife habitat, um, when we get down on the ground and start talking about aquatic habitat values versus maybe habitat values for avian species or terrestrial species, we find conservation folks even speak a different language. Um, you know, the fish folks might want to see a really different hydrology than what the uh, terrestrial species folks want to see on a floodplain. So uh, you have to speak a lot of languages even within the world of conservation to find a multiple benefit project. And then recreation is always a, a really hot topic on river conservation projects. There are strong feelings about public access along the river in the San Joaquin. Lots and lots of private landowners are, are terrified of, of public access and recreation because there's huge uncontrolled amounts of rural crime. Uh, uh, agricultural infrastructure is, is destroyed by vandals. Um, the sheriffs don't have the capacity to even respond. And so uh, the situation that's been unfolding for the last five or 10 years in the rural parts of Stanislaus and San Joaquin County is just one of complete distrust of people accessing the river. It's a real challenge. <clears throat> it's different here in Stockton though. The river walks are wonderful and I don't know that many people are scared of the river walkers stealing copper out of their river pumps. Um, <laughs> Uh, I just threw this illustration <laughs> fundraiser. <laughs> um, so I threw this illustration on here just because I, I, um, I like to point out that um, when we think about the San Joaquin and its whole watershed, here's Bryant Dam right here. But when you start to think about where the water moves from the San Joaquin Valley, you're really talking about Bakersfield all the way to Stockton. And that water circulates around so many times throughout the Central Valley and irrigates hundreds of thousands of productive agricultural acres. I mean, the most productive agricultural region in the world. So basically, this river works really, really hard. Um, this river and water from the Delta works really, really hard to support this enormous economy from Bakersfield all the way to Stockton and beyond. <clears throat> uh, when we're thinking about river conservation projects, these are just some examples of, of diversions off of the river. So um, <clears throat> a lot of times we work with um, private landowners or um, public landowners even to just install simple things like fish screens on their river pumps, right? This would be a, this is a riparian diversion, a river pump where you can just irrigate your farm off of it. And there are so many of these that are just unscreened throughout the system. It's alarming. Um, but we're working hard. We've screened, I think, uh, 10 river pumps so far in just the middle San Joaquin River in the last 10 years. These are expensive uh, installations, but I think well worth it. And then the larger picture there is, um, it's actually the largest unscreened diversion from the San Joaquin River. This is the, um, <clears throat> that's the intake canal for the West Stanislaus Irrigation District. And um, they can pump about 260 CFS out of the river and it's unscreened. So I think all of the resource agencies are working really hard to get a project in place that will uh, screen that diversion and keep fish from getting sucked up the, the intake canal. <clears throat> um, I'll go a little bit through some of these. This is just a, a funny old photo that um, kind of highlights the, the way we think about the river in the San Joaquin Valley in agriculture. Anyways, okay, so when the river gets full, this is what this landscape looks like. Way different. <clears throat> um, just for reference, the, um, the river that you were looking at in the very first photo is kind of just meandering across like this. And the uh, acreage of flooding is astounding. It's hard to even trace back which dam releases caused this, which rainstorm caused this. It's actually a cacophony of management in a lot of different ways that causes floods like this. Uh, devastating floods like this occurred on the San Joaquin, um, all, and this uh, goes all the way into San Joaquin County. Um, but this happened in 1997, in 2006, and then again in 2011. Not a lot of people heard about flood damages from the last water year, but um, lots and lots of farmers on the rural parts along the San Joaquin River were flooded out last year. <clears throat> so when we think about 
habitat. We also see banks of the river that look like this in this area, and this is the same on the Lower Tuolumne and the Lower Stanislaus. Not so bad on the Lower Stanislaus, but Lower Tuolumne and Lower Merced. Um, you don't have shade for, for aquatic species or any kind of terrestrial habitat for wildlife. Here's a nice big stand of Arundo, horrible weed problems all along the river. And then, oh, this is a, a slide just to remind me to talk a little bit about competing uh, permitting along the river, right? So forgive me, it's such a grainy photo, but it's an old slide. Um, <coughs> it's a valley elderberry longhorn beetle. And then on the other side, a, a slicked off levee, a levee that looks the way you're, um, well, it's actually a little bit out of compliance because there are some branches down low on a tree, but it's close to uh, the way a levee needs to look uh, according to the inspectors from Department of Water Resources or the Army Corps of Engineers. And um, <coughs> what we found in, in doing a lot of restoration throughout the Central Valley is that elderberry bushes, which are the host plant for this beetle, which is federally threatened, elderberry bushes can't handle um, any kind of inundation, but they have to be really close to water, which means that that sweet spot where elderberry bushes would live throughout the Central Valley is that exact slope that you're not allowed to have any vegetation growing on. It's one of the biggest problems for um, conservation of that beetle right there. And um, <coughs> fear of being prosecuted under the Endangered Species Act kind of keeps anyone from allowing elderberries to grow up along the edges of the rivers in this area just because if an elderberry does establish then that's perceived as some kind of enormous permitting headache that's going to keep you from being able to maintain your levees the way they need to be maintained. Um, okay, so I threw in a few wildlife ones here just to remind me that it's more than just fish. We've talked a lot about fish today, but the San Joaquin River and its tributaries, the bottom of the San Joaquin Valley is this highway for migratory birds. Pacific Flyway, this is a bunch of, um, <coughs> we've got sandhill cranes and a bunch of snow geese. Um, hundreds of thousands of them spend their winters um, along the San Joaquin River and on its floodplains um, and are hugely impacted by the, the decisions that are made um, to manage water in the San Joaquin Valley uh, and to manage habitat. <coughs> in the summertime, migrants that come up from Central and South America and um, nest in riparian habitats um, also use this Pacific Flyway uh, migratory pathway and are very, very threatened. A lot of species that were once very common throughout the San Joaquin Valley are now extirpated locally or um, near that. Uh, and then, <laughs> this is, um, then this is a, an example of a terrestrial species that's on the brink of extinction because it's reliant upon that very sensitive edge of the lower rivers. This is a riparian brush rabbit um, who, uh, Following the floods of 1997, they thought it might be completely extinct. It was known from just one population at Caswell Memorial State Park on the Stanislaus River. And um, <coughs> I'm going to go kind of next into a description of an example project, kind of our, our flagship project here in the San Joaquin Valley, um, and talk a little bit about the partnerships that helped to put it together and then circle back to the brush rabbit. Um, <coughs> so, Here's the Stanislaus River where JD took us on a little a tour recently. And then the um, San Joaquin where John was, was showing us is further off the map to the south. Um, so here we've got the Tuolumne River coming into the San Joaquin River and then the confluence with the Stanislaus. And this area right here, the San Joaquin River National Wildlife Refuge, was first established to protect, to protect wintering grounds for Aleutian um, cackling geese that were listed as federally threatened. And following the floods of 1997, three reclamation districts on the west side of the San Joaquin River, the landowners all threw up their arms and said, I'm done with cleaning up after the flood. My farms always flood. It costs way too much to, to maintain it. I'm going to sell my property to the Fish and Wildlife Service. So the Fish and Wildlife Service and NRCS came together and, and they had some funding and they bought the fee title to those lands. And the Fish and Wildlife Service became a levy district or the, became the owner of actually three levy districts. And they decided, well, we're the federal government and we're going to put a little MOU in place and stop maintaining the edges of our levees. It's pretty sweet. Um, so uh, restoration has been ongoing there since 2002. Uh, there's been over 2,500 acres of riparian floodplains and seasonal wetlands and permanent wetlands uh, reestablished across those green areas that you can see on the map here. 
And um, the kind of the next phase that's unfolding right now is this red parcel you can see um, on the south and east side of the confluence is a 1600 acre parcel called Dos Rios Ranch, which was just purchased for conservation. <clears throat> so you can see this is all downstream from Modesto. And um, there's actually quite a bit of population in this area, even though it's a very rural agricultural area. So putting together projects, even on the National Wildlife Refuge, um, requires a huge amount of partnership with a wide diversity of folks. Um, putting together a land acquisition in this area with um, local support from a broad variety of partners was um, a really massive undertaking. It's about a 10-year effort to put that together. <clears throat> so this is that project. Um, you can see there's some infrastructure issues, um, uh, major transmission lines that cross the floodplain um, that take special kind of consideration and coordination to make sure that uh, when you're not going to maintain those levees anymore, you're not also going to destroy some very important infrastructure. Um, and then in this image, you can also see <coughs> elevated refugia that was constructed for terrestrial species. So while the farmers would get flooded out by these floods all the time <coughs> and it would damage their crops and cost a lot of money to, to clean up the fields, uh, restored habitat also goes underwater, deep amounts of water in this area because it is such an altered flood regime. It is such a different amount of water than would naturally flood this area and still unnaturally constrained. So um, <coughs> as we started developing um, habitat restoration plans, we started to discover really quickly that the terrestrial species need high ground. So uh, vegetating the levees to provide high ground for terrestrial species and also constructing uh, mounds that would stand out of the floodwaters was a really uh, important adaptation for all of the restoration design out here. <coughs> this is what it looks like as the water drains off. You can see there's huge amounts of sediment uh, deposited, big sand splays across the floodplain. Um, and this has all kinds of implications for uh, maintenance of downstream levees, maintenance of conveyance in the flood channel. Um, and um, costs to reclaim agricultural fields after floods. Um, yeah, here's a couple schematics of planting some high ground. This is an Army Corps of Engineers levee right along the edge of the river that's been planted with trees and shrubs to provide habitat. And uh, this is highly functioning uh, wildlife habitat and what they call transient floodwater storage. So this is basically the land side of a levee. <coughs> and the levee is still intact. <clears throat> when the river gets high enough, when it reaches a peak flood stage, the levee can be breached and this entire area is about 500 acres. The entire 500 acres can have, um, uh, can provide flood storage for a short amount of time. And what that does is kind of re reduces the, just the very peak of a flood that might be coming down the river that might cause a lot of damages for downstream communities. So um, in this individual case, uh, these, these properties, the San Joaquin River Refuge and Dos Rios Ranch, can provide about 30,000 acre feet of storage during, uh, during large flood events, uh, which the, the folks at the Department of Water Resources really like. Um, <coughs> in the, well, 30,000 acre feet doesn't make a huge difference down here. It makes about a three inch reduction in flood stage over a six mile stretch of the river. Um, they view it as a, as a model project, one of these projects where you have multiple benefits servicing multiple different um, constituencies who use the river, um, <coughs> and you can cost leverage. So the Department of Water Resources now through this project has been uh, given 30,000 acre feet of transient flood water storage, and the Department of Water Resources has paid about 20% of the cost of developing it. So it's a really important um, effort for them. And then the part that I didn't talk about is, is recreation, and this area does have walking paths, um, fishing access, um, all kinds of opportunities for local area residents to go experience the out of doors. <coughs> this is a lot like a photo that JD showed us, it's just years um, one, two, and three. This isn't the Muller Tract, but it's close by. Um, and you can see the, the agricultural heritage of these, these projects. It looks a lot like planting an orchard at first. But by three years in, it's a, it's a diverse forest that hosts a lot of wildlife. <coughs> uh, just another landscape shot. Um, so those are all the photos I had to show you. Um, I did want to talk a little bit more about wildlife recovery because um, while the San Joaquin River is obviously still in, in tremendous trouble from a water quality perspective, from a habitat perspective, I think um, it's important uh, to take away from this 
meeting that we're making progress, right? Just like John said, there's, there's stuff happening that is, um, uh, you know, a demonstration for what can continue to grow along the San Joaquin River and up into our other watersheds as well um, to really improve the quality of life for people in the San Joaquin Valley as well as the quality of uh, our environment and of wildlife habitat or wildlife populations. So this individual refuge here has had wildlife monitoring ongoing throughout the entire restoration and um, there have been some real wildlife successes. There have been some federally endangered birds that have showed up for the first time in over 60 years and trees that were planted out on the floodplain in the middle of a farm field. Um, <clears throat> there have been uh, increases in the numbers of populations. So, um, for example, in 2002, yellow warblers out at this site, there was only one breeding pair. And in 2009, there were 26 breeding pairs. And that's a California species of concern. So the, the monitoring data is coming in and, you know, it, it's proving that this works. This is providing the wildlife habitat that is, you know, targeted by the project. Um, it's providing groundwater recharge. I think we were talking about that in another group where we were actually parking water on large swaths of land and letting it percolate back in. Um, it's improving water quality by filtering out sediments as the river makes its way downstream. And um, it's not without its challenges, but, <laughs> but um, being able to focus, I guess, on, on rewarding projects helps everybody who's a, you know, a team member in putting something like this together uh, feel empowered to go on and do more. So that's what I had prepared.